Welcome everyone to GIA Knowledge Sessions, a series of talks and seminars about gemology fueled by our decades of research. At GIA, we consider ourselves so fortunate to study and learn from gems, and it's our mission to share our discoveries with you. I'm Nathan Renfro, manager of GIA's Colored Stones Department, and I'm joined today by Wim Vertrice, the manager of GIA's Field Gemology Department. And with that, I'm gonna pass you over to Wim. Thanks, Nathan, for the introduction. Um, so welcome all. Uh, I see we have a big crowd from all over the world. Um, it's very early or very late for some people in Australia, I see even. Um, so it's great. Welcome all. Uh, and I hope you're, you guys will all enjoy this talk. So today we'll talk about blue sapphire treatment. I want to already start with stressing that we'll focus on blue sapphire. Um, so there's going to be some topics that blend into other colors as well, but the main focus today will be on blue. So before we get started, I think it's important that we uh, start with a few refresher terminology, a little bit of sapphire essentials so that we all know what we're going to be talking about. Um, I mean, I think everyone has the feeling already that we'll focus very heavily on heat treatment. Um, so I will try to focus a little bit on the processes that happen during heat treatment. Um, what is actually going on within the stone and why is heat treatment so effective on certain blue sapphires and not effective on other blue sapphires? So those will be a little bit the questions that we're diving into today and that, we'll try, that I'll try to give you, uh, shine some light upon it. So I think the first thing we have to start with is um, sapphire is corundum. So corundum is aluminum oxide, a fairly simple mineral. Um, comprised of aluminum and oxygen atoms. So we've got aluminum, which has a three plus charge, so three positive charge, and oxygen, which is uh, divalent negative, so two minus two. So if we combine two of those aluminum and three of those oxygens, we get a neutrally charged crystals, which is something that's very important because that's what all natural crystals strive towards, that neutral charge balance. So you need the same amount of positive charges as negative charges. So we've got six, positive and six negative from those three oxygen and from those two aluminum and they balance each other out uh, maintaining a neutral state. Now the perfectly pure corundum is completely colorless. This does not absorb light. Um, some people term this white sapphire, colorless sapphire. So if you have pure aluminum, uh, aluminum oxide, this does not absorb light. So all the light that goes in comes out again. Now, of course, this is not what we know from our precious gems, rubies, and sapphires. So the corundum gems actually have many, many colors. We've got the variety ruby, which is the red variety, which is often colored by trace amounts of chromium in there. So it's actually because that little bit of chromium in there that we get that red color. And we have a lot of fancy sapphires. Those are basically all the colors except for red and blue. Uh, that could be colorless, yellow, green, pink, purple, orange, color change, brown, you name it, they have it in uh, fancy sapphire. The only exception might be a really grassy, pure green. Um, and those are caused by a variety of chromophores. And then we have the sapphire, blue sapphire. So when we talk about sapphire just as is, people understand that we um, talk about blue sapphire. So when I'm talking about sapphire today, always assume I'm going to be talking about blue sapphire. But blue is still a pretty wide range. Um, I think here we've got a series of some blue sapphires. So we see there's still different color varieties, different tones, which means that some of them are going to be more desirable, others are going to be less desirable, which means that there is going to be an incentive to treat those stones. Treatment with an eye to optimize color. We can treat gemstones for a number of reasons. We can do it to enhance clarity, for example. But in Sapphire, most of the treatment focuses on optimizing the color. And optimizing the color can work in two ways. It can, be, it can mean increasing the blue component, which means that if you have a very light blue stone, you want to add some extra blue. Or if you have a very dark blue stone, you want to actually reduce that blue a little bit. So increasing, decreasing that blue component, basically playing with those blues, that is what most of blue sapphire treatment is actually all about. 
So if we want to play with that blue color, we first need a good understanding of what causes it. So the color in blue sapphire is caused by iron and titanium impurity. So when those two combine, there is an intervalence charge transfer going on that absorbs most of the yellow and the red light, which basically leaves all the blue light to still pass through the stone. So we've got white light, which comprises the entire visible spectrum going into the stone. And almost every wavelength, what we see here, is absorbed except for the blue one. So only the blue light is let through the stone. So that's why we perceive blue sapphires as blue stones, because it has those iron and titanium intervalence charge transfer going on in there. So we need those iron and titanium, uh, iron two plus and titanium four plus in that corundum crystal. So remember, we've got that corundum crystal made up of these aluminum ions and those oxygen ions. So we want to put some iron two plus and titanium four plus in there. So we take out a few of those aluminum three plus. So remember, we still need to go for that balance. So we still need to have for three oxygens, we need to get that positive charge balance of six. So ideally we do it with two aluminums, that is three plus three gives you six, but we can do it with an iron and a titanium, which is gonna be two plus four but that is still six, so that is still a neutrally neutral um, a neutral crystal. Um, so that is actually a stable form. And it is because we've got that pair of iron and titanium, so iron two plus and titanium four plus right next to each other, that we've got that creation of blue color. So if we go back again to the reasons why we want to create uh, why we want to heat treat blue sapphire the one of the reasons could be we increase the blue which basically comes down to we want more of that iron titanium intervalence char charge transfer which means that we can either get more iron two plus or we get more titanium four plus into the crystal because if we have both of those in increased concentrations, we will have those pairs forming in increased concentrations, which will result in an increased blue color. Now, in some cases, we want to decrease that blue color, which means that we have to destroy some of the iron two plus titanium four plus uh, charge transfer, which means that we either reduce the amount of iron two plus in the stone, we reduce the amount of titanium four plus in the stone, or we break the connection between both because we need to have those pairs. Even if there's a lot of iron and titanium within the stone, if they're not paired with each other, they won't create that blue color. Now to make those changes in those stones, that will require energy because we will um, uh, change valence states, diffuse some materials in and out, and that requires energy. So that is why we always do this at increased heat because that is where those processes will be more efficient. So the more heat we add, the more efficient those processes will go. And actually some processes require a certain threshold to be, to be passed before those processes start happening. So this is a very basic, very theoretical approach where we got a, a sapphire, a piece of corundum, so aluminum oxide with some iron and titanium in there. So ideally that would always form a nice blue sapphire. Now, I think one of my favorite quotes from John Koivula, our colleague in, uh, at GIA, uh, he once said, mother nature cooks in a dirty kitchen. And this is exactly true for the chemical impurities in a natural blue sapphire, which means that there's a lot of other trace elements within that, um, within natural corundum. Um, so chemical impurities, sometimes in very minute concentrations, but even those very small concentrations can be enough to tip the balance in certain directions. So here I've got a list of some of the possible substitutions. For example, you can have an iron two plus and a silicon four plus instead of a titanium. You can have an iron three plus instead of an aluminum three plus. You can have an iron two plus plus a hydrogen that is also three plus. So that can substitute for an aluminum as well. You can put some magnesium in there. You can even remove some of those oxygen, reduce some of those oxygens. So basically form a trap, what we call a trapped hole. And those trapped holes can com combine with other elements to form other colors. 
for example, most of the ones I've listed here, they don't actually produce any color, but some of them start producing very strong color. So a very small amount of what we call trapped holes with iron will create a very strong yellow color. So even a tiny uh, switch in the balance there can result in a very drastic change of the overall color of the sapphire. So remind you, natural materials, we've got a lot of chemical imp impurities that we have to account for, and that can really play an important role when we're playing with those color balances. Now, of course, natural blue sapphire also has a, lot, has a lot of visible impurities. I think here we've got some beautiful milky rutile clouds. So these milky clouds comprise of very fine material, very fine particles of rutile. In other sapphires, it is more expressed as needles. So we've got rutile needles. Um, and those rutile needles, um, they can be very short, can be very long, but it's exactly the same material in those clouds as in those needles. And those of you familiar with rutile, you all know that rutile is titanium dioxide. So I think you already feel that, there's a, that they, those can play a very important role. Because remember, blue color is caused by that combination of iron 2 plus and titanium 4 plus. And if we've got that reserve of titanium locked in these particles, if we can unleash that, that has a huge potential to create additional blue in our sapphires. So I think that's enough for an introduction for blue sapphire. And I hope, uh, I think everyone sees already that this is gonna be a little bit more technical than most of the other lectures I've given before. But if we take it slow, uh, I think we will all um, get a better understanding of what's going on when we heat treat um, uh, sapphires with the goal of creating extra blue or reducing that blue color. So I said already, heat treatment, I feel the need, the need to heat. That is what most blue sapphire treatment comes down to. Now, before we get into heat treatment and really the specifics of blue sapphire, we have to discuss a few things about heat treatment itself. So heat treatment, there's a thousand different ways to do it, but there are five basic parameters that need to be defined if you wanna talk about heat treatment. So the first one is gonna be time. That result, that means the time you spend at the maximum temperature, but also how fast are you heating stones and how quick are you cooling them? That can have an effect on some uh, treatments as well. And the temperatures that we're treating at, we can treat stones at a couple of hundred degrees Celsius, and we can go up to 1,900 degrees Celsius. That is not because the sapphire starts melting. That's just the practical working limit of most commercial furnaces out there. If you go at higher temperature, your furnace will start to melt, basically. Then we've got the atmosphere. The atmosphere where you heat treat materials, so the surroundings of the stone, that is very important as well. And there we separate between a reducing environment and an oxidizing environment. I'll go a little bit deeper in that later on. Then we've got added chemicals. Do we simply put the sapphires alone in the, in the furnace or do we add some other materials? We can pack it in certain chemicals and those chemicals can have a very big effect on the end result of our sapphire. And then of course, the starting material. Um, here we always assume that we're talking about blue sapphire, but still every blue sapphire is different. The trace element composition can be very different. The inclusions that are present, the, start, the, color, the initial color of the material, do you start with a very pale material? Do you start with a very dark material? All of that has an impact on defining your heat treatment and the ultimate goals, the ultimate settings of your heat treatment process. So I'm gonna focus on three types of heat treatment here. We'll start out with what we call low temperature heat treatment. Then we'll move on to high temperature heat treatment, which will include probably the most dramatic change of all the Geuda heat treatment of which we see an example on the right here. And then I'll focus a little bit on heat treatment with diffusion of other elements. So those first two, that is where we do not add extra chemicals. So we just heat treat the sapphires as they are. While in that third variety, we will add some other elements and uh, add those to the sapphire during the treatment. So the low temperature heat treatment is the first one we're gonna discuss. This is a very old treatment. This has been described 
a thousand years ago, has been practiced for ages, specifically in Sri Lanka, with the goal of reducing that blue component. So that is done on three types of stones, three types of stones that are very common in the Sri Lankan gem gravels. Um, the first goal would be to lighten your dark blue stones. So sometimes you have sapphires that are a little bit too dark. With this kind of treatment, you can reduce a little bit of that blue and make it more attractive. You can make colorless sapphires out of very pale blue material. Colorless sapphires back in the days used as a diamond imitation. Um, but if they have a little bit of a blue, uh, blue color to them, so to get rid of that, to make pure colorless sapphire, you can also use this treatment in some cases. And then optimizing pink sapphires. Some of the pink sapphires in Sri Lanka have a little bit of a blue tint to it. To get rid of that blue tint, you can also use this type of treatment. Now, these, the changes that we see in this treatment are usually rather subtle. These are not drastic changes where we go from pale stones to extremely dark stones or from extremely dark stones to almost no visible color anymore, usually very subtle changes. I think here we've got some examples um, of, of tree stones. So the top row, they are not treated. And then the bottom row, we see uh, the same stones that are heated at 900 Celsius. So that is still within the range that we consider low temperature treatment. Um, and they are treated just in air. So that would be an oxidizing uh, environment. But you see that in some cases, like in the first and the second one, that change in color is rather um, is rather obvious, but in that third stone, it is a more subtle change. So that subtle change, that is more something that we associate with those low temperature heat treatment. Now keep in mind, a subtle change in color can mean a really big price in value uh, and overall color in a faceted stone. So even those tiny changes can make a really big impact on the final material. So, what actually happens at this low temperature treatment? It basically comes down to we drive out um, H plus, so hydrogen, from the corundum. At, at increased temperatures, hydrogen diffuses out of corundum pretty efficiently, especially in an oxidizing environment. So what we basically have is we've got this balance of an iron two plus and an hydrogen plus. So that totals three plus with an aluminum three plus. And that, of course, comes to that uh, total balance of six plus compensated by three oxygen atoms. So that gives you a completely neutral uh, crystal. But during that heat treatment, we get rid of that H plus. So that hydrogen is removed from it, which means that your iron two plus will turn into an iron three plus to, to basically keep that neutral balance within the stone. That results in less iron two plus available because all our iron two plus is oxidized to iron three plus, which means that we don't have iron two plus available to combine with our titanium four plus. So that original color creating pair is broken up because the iron two plus is no longer available. So that gives you that decrease in blue color. So in what kind of stones does this work? This basically works in almost every stone with some iron titanium pairs, uh, some iron titanium intervalence charge transfer. But again, the amount that can be reduced is often limited to it. And to show you an example that this works in almost every stone with iron titanium intervalence charge transfer, I've got an example of some rubies here actually. So here we're looking at a Mozambican ruby that has some very faint blue color zoning going through it. You're, get, you're able to get rid of that blue color zone by this low temperature treatment by just treating it. Here we see it 800 degrees Celsius for two hours and 40 minutes. So it's not extremely high temperatures. It's not extremely long durations, but all that hydrogen diffuses out. Your iron oxidizes to iron three plus, which basically breaks your iron two plus titanium four plus intervalence charge transfer, which results in less blue color because your iron three plus by itself does not create any blue color. Now, another process that happens at lower temperature is the breaking up of iron titanium pairs. Um, the, this, is, um, this is a process where those cooking rates, so the, the heating rates and the cooling rates are actually uh, assumed to be very important since these pairs reform pretty quickly. 
So what is assumed here that when you go to higher temperature, those iron titanium uh, ions that are supposed to be next to each other, they actually start drifting apart. And when they drift apart, they, they're not coupled anymore, which means that they don't result in that blue color anymore. Now, this effect is most obvious in stones where, they, where there's a lot of blue color, so where, there, where they drift apart um, and you get a result in low, uh, this results in lower blue color. Now, again, this exact process is not exactly understood. It's not exactly quantified. So we don't really know the balance of these two processes. There might be other processes involved there. Um, low temperature treatment is still being studied a lot since there's a lot of renewed attention to this treatment. And we're learning a lot about this um, during different heat treatment experiments. Oh, so here we've got an example where actually those iron and titanium ions are drifted apart and they no longer cause a blue color. So high temperature treatments. The first thing we'll have to do is um, define high temperature treatment. So remember, the examples I gave at low temperature treatment were at temperatures 800 Celsius, 900 Celsius. We define high temperature treatment as the temperature where rutile silk starts dissolving. So on the right, we've got two images of the same area of the same stone, one before treatment and one after treatment. So we can see that all of these rutile needles they're mostly dissolved. If you look very closely, you still see some remnants of it, what we call peppered needles. So they're completely broken up. Most of them actually dissolved into the corundum. Now this has a potential impact on clarity since particles are dissolving. So this can contribute in a color change of the uh, color improvement of the stone, but also improve clarity of the sapphires. Um, to note, the boundary of this is roughly set at 1,200 Celsius, but of course, there's these other parameters that come into play, like, for example, um, the uh, duration is another important parameter. But around 1,200, 1,300 Celsius, that is where we can basically put that boundary. Now, the impact of the color by this treatment is very variable. You can either reduce your blue component or create additional blue. And all of that depends on the exact atmosphere that we're treating in. So we're talking, we'll, we'll go a little bit more into depth on that part right now. So controlling that atmosphere in furnaces. So basically for heat treatment, we have two types of furnaces. We've got combustion furnaces where heat is created by burning certain materials, usually carbohydrates, can be oil, can be gas, can be coal, can be wood, can be a combination of those. Um, and here on the right, we see the typical Sri Lankan developed black like mini furnaces where they pump gases through it and are able to uh, control with that gas composition, the environment. So when we're talking about an oxidizing environment, that means that we have an excess of oxygen you can create that by just blowing more air or more oxygen in it because air is naturally an oxidizing environment. So if we just keep the surrounding environment as our heat treatment environment, we're talking about an oxidizing environment. So a reducing environment would be when we add excess fuel, which means that we don't get complete combustion. There's no oxygen left over. All the oxygen is consumed um, during the burning of those materials, during the creation of all that energy. And that will result in an atmosphere that is rich in CO, but also in hydrogen and hydrogen H2. That is something, remember, we've seen that plays a big role already in the low temperature treatment and can play a big role in the balance of the iron in the sapphires. So remember already that reducing environment, that's gonna be very interesting for heat treatment also at high temperatures. Now, these combustion furnaces, they're still widely used, but these are more the classic type of furnaces. They've got some disadvantages. Um, you need to keep adding fuel. It is very hard to keep, to create a stable heating environment in it. Um, so a lot of people switched over to electric furnaces. So here your heat is provided by heating elements. Basically put it in the plug and it becomes hot. So there's no actual chemical reactions, no burning going on within that furnace. 
So if you want to create an oxidizing environment there, you can add extra oxygen, but usually just a general environment, just the air around us has enough oxygen in it to create an oxidizing environment. If you want to reduce, uh, if you want to create a reducing environment, which means that you want to get rid of all that oxygen, you, you can either, one way to do it is add some, some wood, some charcoal in that furnace, and that will burn up and consume all the oxygen. So that's one way to do it. Add some carbohydrate, add some, some wood, some, um, some charcoal in the furnace and that will, or in the crucible, and that will consume all the oxygen around it, create, creating that reducing environment. Another option is to flush your furnace with oxygen pure, poor gases. Any mix of gases can be used here. Um, you can use nitrogen, you can do it with CO and H2, um, you can do it with CO and CO2. That will all have different effects. So you can play around with those, um, but that reducing environment is still something that you will create in those means. So what happens in oxidizing environments at high temperature? So remember here, we're still discussing high temperature treatment. So we're at this temperature where rutile is dissolving. So oxidizing environment, the first thing that happens regardless of the environment is titanium diffuses from the rutile particles into the corundum. So we add a bunch of extra titanium into our corundum. Extra titanium can be a good thing because if we want to create more blue and we don't have enough titanium already, we only need to get a little bit more iron two plus and then we create iron two plus titanium extra blue. Now that's not happening in oxidizing environments. In oxidizing environments, your iron two plus oxidizes to iron three plus. So what we do, what, what happens here, whoops, is as a result, we have more titanium four plus available. So that would be a good thing to create extra blue, but actually there is no more iron two plus available. So while we are pumping a lot of titanium into the stone, we don't have any iron two plus left to pair with it, to create extra blue. That means that, first of all, there is no additional iron titanium intervalence tra charge transfer happening, which means that there's no extra blue created. Plus on top of it, any existing blue is reduced because that iron two plus that was originally there and already pairing with titanium is oxidized to iron three plus. And that iron three plus does not cause any color in combination with that titanium. So your blue color actually decreases in oxidizing environments. Now, again, optimizing this process requires fine tuning of all these different parameters. Um, it's a very delicate chemical balance that you need to find there. So working with this requires a lot of experience, a lot of understanding of the stone. Um, there's mixed results coming out of it because maybe your atmosphere wasn't as oxidizing as you thought. Maybe there was some reduction going on as well. Maybe there is reduction of iron two plus because of other processes. So again, it's a very complex affair, requires fine tuning and very deep understanding of the, the stones itself, but also the parameters, the heating, the heat treatment process, the heat treatment equipment. Now, let's take a look at what happens in reducing environments. So, reducing environments, again, regardless of environments, we diffuse titanium four plus from those rutile particles into the corundum. Now, any iron three plus that is in the stone reduces to iron two plus, because remember, we're in that reducing environment, which means that we go from an iron three plus um, to an iron two plus. Iron two plus is, some, is one component that we need to create blue, but we need that titanium four plus. So we've got during that treatment, a lot of titanium four plus coming in from the particles. And then we've got hydrogen coming in, which is actually reducing the iron three plus to iron two plus. So we've got that combination of iron two plus and new titanium four plus, which will result in extra blue color. So Basically what happens in reducing environments is we make titanium four plus available and we turn all our iron into iron two plus, which means that we've got the perfect conditions 
for iron titanium intervalence charge transfer, which creates more blue color. So with reducing environment, we can create extra blue color in a stone. And the best example is probably this. This is in essence what happens during Geuda treatment. I think the first time this was really applied on a large scale was on Sri Lankan Geuda material. So Geuda material is defined as um, white, translucent, can even be brownish, but very rich in rutil particles and does not have a lot of color. But by heat treating it, those rutil particles dissolve into the crystal, which means that you optimize the clarity already. But by adding all that titanium, you're able to create a lot of iron titanium pairs, able to create extra blue color. So here we've got the same crystal. The left side is left untreated. The right side is treated. So we slice this in two, treated one part. So you see this type of rough makes a dramatic uh, change from this milky, colorless, cloudy, translucent material to clear, transparent, blue, fine material. Now, the Sri Lankan Geuda material is, exact, is extremely fine, um, but, uh, works extremely well with this because the rutile particles are very fine and very evenly distributed, which means that they diffuse very easily and very efficiently because the smaller the particles, the more efficient the diffusion goes. But you also have a very even distribution, which will result in a very even distribution of your titanium, which will result in a very even distribution of your blue color throughout the stone. Plus, on top of that, the Sri Lankan Geuda has a natural low iron content, which means that you're not creating too much blue, because that can happen as well with some of this Geuda-like material, that you're actually going from this milky white material to a stone that is so dark blue because you create so much blue color in it by putting so much titanium in it or having so much titanium coupled with the iron that you actually create too much blue and making the stone undesirable. So this is a perfect case scenario that Sri Lankan material really works, works really well with it. But of course, we find this type of material um, in basically every sapphire deposit around the world. So this exact process happens in a lot of materials uh, a lot of sapphires from around the world. And here we're looking at a different type of process, uh, the, the same process, but in a different type of sapphire. So here we're looking at a Montana sapphire that was treated by my colleagues in uh, the Carlsbad lab uh, for an upcoming research article. So keep an eye open for that one. Um, what we see here on the left before treatment, we see that there's a lot of silk in this sapphire very nice hexagonal core, some rough silk here in the bottom. But you see a more dense, fine cloud, a little bit triangular shaped in the, in the center, uh, towards the right of the center here, right here. I hope you can all see my pointer. Um, now, if we look at the same stone under the same lining conditions, after treatment, we see that this milky cloud has actually become more transparent and there's blue color that developed there. Now, if we look at the same stone in transmitted light, we see how obvious that blue color zoning is, is, uh, is present. So we see actually where we had that band, that really dense band of, of, root, of uh, milky clouds right here, that actually corresponds to the dense, to the most blue part in the sapphire. And then if we look, for example, to the left here, where there's none of that really fine cloudy material, there's almost no blue color forming there. So you see there's really a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the presence of that nice cloudy silk uh, with the formation of those blue zones. So you see this happens in a lot of sapphire, but usually this is very heterogeneous, very difficult to predict, um, and not always great results. So that is what makes Geuda evaluation, so tricky and really an expert opinion. Um, now, of course, a high temperature treatment does not always result on this. And here we'll look at a few cases why high temperature treatment does not always result in creation of extra blue. The first example is some one that we've already discussed. That is when you heat treat in oxidizing environments, that means that 
all your iron is oxidized, which means that you only have iron three plus and iron three plus with your titanium does not create blue color. In fact, that I will actually decrease the blue color of your stone. So that's one reason why high temperature treatment does not re result in extra blue color. Another example might be that there's simply no iron present in the corundum lattice. So even if you start pumping a lot of titanium in there from the silk, if there's no iron to couple with, it's not going to result in any blue color. Now, again, the second case, extremely rare in natural corundum because most natural sapphires will have some iron presence in them. But this could be the case, for example, in a synthetic material or in a lab-grown sapphire that is grown without any um, iron, even if you start diffusing titanium into it, it will not result in that blue color because there's no iron present. Now, the other case could be true as well, that there's simply no titanium. A stone that is completely clear that does not have those milky clouds, that means that there's simply no titanium to diffuse into the stone, that will also not result in any extra blue color. So if you have a colorless sapphire without any silk and you will heat treat it, you will not create any blue because there's no titanium in there, not in the particles to diffuse into the stone, not in the stone to begin with. So that will not result in extra blue color. Now, there are also a couple of other more complex um, features. Remember in the beginning, I told you that uh, most sapphires are actually a pretty messy affair if you look at the trace element chemistry. Now, a lot of these trace elements that are present in sapphire, even at very minute amounts, we're talking parts per million here. So if you have a million atoms, only one of them could be different. Could be, for example, a magnesium or a, or a, sil or a silicon. But that can have a really big impact on the color. And measuring that, is, those are really some breakthroughs that were made in the last decades, um, being able to quantify those, being able to um, really evaluate the impact of these trace elements. Um, very interesting material, very complex. Uh, there's a lot of literature published in recent years about this. So if this is something that interests you, make sure to check that out. Um, I think your best source would probably be um, an article that discusses all the chromophores in natural sapphire that was published in Gems and Gemology last year. Um, so that would be a good source to go over that as well. So we've got a lot of these different trace elements in there. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on magnesium here. Now, if you've got magnesium in your sapphire, magnesium will actually pair with titanium before your iron does. So if you've got a lot of magnesium in there, you will form a lot of magnesium titanium pairs because they're just better buds. Uh, magnesium and titanium like to hang out better than iron and titanium. So as long as there's magnesium available, titanium will form pairs with that magnesium. Um, but that magnesium titanium couple that does not form color. It is only the iron titanium uh, pair that will result in that blue color. So you need to have all that magnesium compensated for before you can actually start creating blue color. So if you have a stone with a very high magnesium concentration, you might actually not be able to put enough titanium in there to have some titanium available for your, blue sap to, for your iron to create blue sapphire. So imagine this, you've got a stone with a lot of rutile silk, but also with a lot of magnesium. So you're able to put a lot of titanium into your stone, but all your titanium will couple with the magnesium, which means that all your iron is still just there hanging out, not coupling with titanium. But only when every magnesium has a titanium body, the titanium will start coupling with the iron. So if you have a stone with very high magnesium content, you can start diffusing a lot of titanium in there, but it will have no result. It will not create any blue color. So that trace element chemistry of the stone, also very important to understand that uh, and plays a very big role, even at very minute concentrations. Um, so especially determined by magnesium, uh, but there are other trace elements that play a role there as well. But in natural sapphires, it is mostly determined by the presence of 
the available magnesium. Now, let's look at some different treatments. Treatments where we add some stuff to the mix. So all the previous, um, all the previous uh, topics that we've discussed, that was focused on natural sapphire without adding any external elements, which basically means that we've got a sapphire with a fixed chemical composition. Yes, some elements move place. Some elements go, like for example, that titanium can go from that particle and actually be present in the corundum. But the overall uh, chemical balance of that sapphire is unchanged. There's nothing going out. There's nothing going in. There's just some, some uh, ions switching places. Now, what happens if we add some extra elements? So we add some powders enriched in certain elements to the crucible. And we're going to discuss three um, added elements, cobalt, titanium, and then, of course, everyone's favorite, beryllium. So the first one, cobalt coating. Um, a lot of people call this cobalt diffusion, but that is not technically correct. So in the early 1990s, sapphires were heated in the presence of cobalt. Cobalt, of course, is a chromophore that is very intensely associated with blue color. Um, I think we all know cobalt colored glass uh, results in very fine blue colored glass. So the same basically happens in uh, sapphire. A cobalt spinel is not a great example. Now this is done at relatively low temperatures, uh, 800 to 1000 uh, Celsius, but over a very long time. We're talking more than 10 hours, 20, 30, 40 are no exception. What actually happens is you grow an extremely thin layer of cobalt aluminum oxide on it. So a few micron thick across this entire stone, you start uh, coating it with this new mineral. This new mineral, which is very intensely blue colored, but this is only a few micron thick. Just as an example, um, a human hair is around 70 to 100 micron. And here we're talking four to 10 micron. So really the fraction of the thickness of a human hair is grown all across the sapphire. So this, of course, this is done on faceted stones because if you do this on a rough, this is immediately polished away during fabrication. Now, how do you identify this? These stones, they have a very peculiar color. If you've seen a few, you will recognize them immediately because they have a very homogeneous color distribution, but they also show a cobalt spectrum in the spectroscope, which is very unusual for sapphire. And of course, if you have access to chemical analysis, um, you will immediately spot a very high concentration of cobalt, which is very unusual for natural sapphires. So basically that cobalt coating, that's one way of doing it. So that's the stone that we see on the right here. The stone on the left is treated with a different process. That stone is what we call titanium diffused. So that process was patented in the mid 1970s, where it basically, if we summarize the recipe, it is embed your crystals, uh, embed your sapphires in a powder that contains titanium dioxide and heat for a very long time at a very high temperature. That's basically it. There's more technical challenges to it, but simply explained, you just put it at very extreme conditions in the presence of titanium. And what happens is that titanium enters the surface and pairs with available iron there. So this penetrates the stone from the surface and moves in, but this still results in a very thin rim of blue color. 100 micron, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. Um, usually thicker at the, uh, more intense at the surface. So this is also done on faceted stones. But because this is done at such extreme temperatures under such extreme conditions, um, you actually need to repolish your stones. And it's because of that repolishing of the facets that you start with that um, your stone will have that typical what we call a spider web pattern, where the facet junctions are actually more intensely colored when you look at it in diffused light or when you look at it in immersion. So you will see these irregular color concentrations where facet edges meet because that's where they're not intensely polished. So that includes the girdle as well. So usually the girdle is more intensely colored, but also the facet edges that we can see very nicely more intensely colored. So that really gives away that titanium diffusion process. 
Here we've got a sapphire that is actually sliced in the half. So we see how that titanium pierced into, penetrated into the sapphire and formed that blue rim. Because the internal, uh, basically the, the core of that sapphire is untouched, is still completely colorless. It's only that color concentration on the side. So basically we add extra titanium and it creates blue color because there's already some iron present. So it creates that iron titanium charge transfer resulting in blue color. Now, if we have a stone where there is no iron present, that means that we do not form that iron titanium pair, which means that we do not create extra blue color. Now this opens some possibilities, especially when we start putting huge amounts of titanium into the stone and cool it very, very slowly. So if we do that, we push so much titanium into the stone that it actually, the corundum cannot hold it and it will start forming rutil particles. And if you start forming a lot of rutil particles, you create asterism. So that's how you can create star sapphires by diffusing so much titanium in it that the corundum cannot hold it and that you start creating rutil particles and when you have them nicely aligned, it will result in a star sapphire. So that's how you can create titanium diffused star sapphires. This works if there's not a lot of iron present. So you can do this on some rubies as well, put a star in there. Um, but if there's a lot of iron there under the right conditions, it will actually create a lot of blue color. Then let's move on to the most interesting, most complicated, and most recent of the treatments. Um, beryllium diffusion. Beryllium diffusion was first documented in the early 2000s and like first really studied. Earlier cases probably existed. Um, it basically comes down that you heat your sapphire at a very extreme conditions, so very high temperature for a very long time in contact with beryllium. Initially that was done probably by accident when it was heated in contact with some chrysoberyl because chrysoberyl occurs a lot with sapphire and is often mistaken for it in the rough. So maybe that just happened by accident. Uh, once they figured out that it was chrysoberyl, people actually started crushing up chrysoberyl and using chrysoberyl powders. Um, and then later on when it was really understood that it's just beryllium, people started doing it with just beryllium rich powder. So those are like three generations that we see in there, but they all do the same thing just with different efficiencies. Now beryllium is an element that diffuses very efficiently into corundum. Remember that titanium, it just like got into the rim and there it remained a little bit stuck there and it couldn't really penetrate very deep. That is not true for beryllium. Beryllium diffuses pretty efficiently, so it has pretty good deep uh, penetration, very diffuse rim. That means that like you don't really see that transition between where, uh, you don't really see where the di diffusion stops. So where there's the undiffused and the diffused areas, which means that you can do this on rough because you can actually penetrate all the way through the stone. Um, initially, there were some stones that had a, an, an unaffected core left. But nowadays, most stones are treated so intensely that they're actually um, diffused all the way through. Now, beryllium diffusion impacts a wide variety of chromophores. You can see on the right, all these stones have been treated with beryllium and they've all resulted in magnificent colors. So that means that we get a wide range of colors um, because of that beryllium diffusion. But here we're gonna limit us to uh, blue sapphire. I know that most beryllium diffused stones are not in the blue range, but there are a lot of blue sapphires that are still beryllium diffused. And I think it's important for everyone to understand how that happens and how you can or cannot identify that, that there is some more awareness about it. So remember this slide from about 10 minutes ago where I talked about a high temperature treatment um, that had different results because there was um, there were different interaction pairs that formed, mainly because of that magnesium. Well, beryllium acts in a very similar way. So we put beryllium in there and the beryllium starts messing with the blue color that is already present. So beryllium two plus behaves very similar to magnesium two plus in the blue sapphire, with the exception that it's not naturally present. Magnesium two plus is naturally present. Beryllium two plus is 
introduced during treatment. So what happens is your beryllium will pair with your titanium before your iron can pair. Exactly the same as magnesium. So your beryllium titanium pairs, they don't produce color. And because they are preferred to iron titanium pairs, you get a decrease in iron titanium, which means that that's going to be a decrease in blue color. So the more beryllium you pump in there, the more uh, iron titanium pairs are going to be broken up. So the more that your blue color will decrease. Now, in theory, a perfect ratio of beryllium to titanium will completely cancel out all that color. If you introduce the exact amount of beryllium um, as there is iron titanium pairs, they will all be canceled out and you will end up with a color of sapphire. Now, this is extremely challenging and basically impossible to do in natural stones because there is a lot of color zoning, which means variable titanium concentration. Your trace element, um, your trace element composition varies throughout the stone. It's not homogeneous. And remember, a very small difference, like one or two ppm, can make it can tip that balance in favor of one of the other. So finding that perfect ratio of beryllium to titanium to remove all blue color is basically impossible. You could calculate it, but doing it in a furnace, um, if you can, if you're able to do it, give me a call because I'd love to see it. Um, the other issue that there is with beryllium diffusion is that if you force too much beryllium into a stone, so if you actually have more beryllium than you've got titanium in there, you will start forming different chromophores. And those chromophores can have a very strong yellow color. We don't have time to go deeper into that, um, but that yellow color can also be removed during certain heat treatment processes. So here we've got an example where we look at a very dark blue sapphire uh, with very strong zoning. We diffuse beryllium into it. And then after the beryllium diffusion, we see that we basically split it in two zones. We've got this one zone, this tip on the right here. You see that the blue color has reduced a lot there. But the blue color in the center of the stone, zone two, was already a lot less, was already less intense. And that is actually all gone and we've created yellow. So that means that we've tipped that balance from blue we aim for that colorless, but getting there is very difficult. So we tipped it over to that yellow, but then in a different, in a follow-up process step, you can get rid of that yellow as well. But you see overall using beryllium diffusion, you're able to lighten the color of dark blue sapphires. Now detecting it, I'm gonna go a little bit quick for this because I see we're running out of time. So detecting heat treatment, microscope observation, crystal alterations, um, highly variable. Depends on the temperature, duration, type of crystal. Here we see some very subtle um, tension fractures forming around it. Uh, in this case, it's way more obvious, very obvious tension fracture. And the crystal is completely turned into mush. Uh, this is what we call a snowball inclusion. It's completely turned fluffy. No idea what, what this was before, but obviously subjected to very intense conditions. The solution of particles and needles happens only at higher temperatures, because remember, that's where we put that boundary of high temperature treatment. Um, glassy residue on the surface. Um, your crucible is not always 100% clear. Some parts of your crucible start melting, fuse to your surface. So that glassy residue, if you heat treat at very extreme conditions, that's why you need to repolish some stones. But some of, sometimes they're still preserved. Then color zoning can be a good indication for heat treatment, especially when it's not following crystal structure. So like, for example, those spider web patterns, colored rims for diffusion sapphires, but also internal diffusion. Um, around bigger rutile crystals, you can have um, these blue spots. Those are not an indication of beryllium treatment. Those are an indication of very intense treatment conditions that are used for beryllium treatment, but not exclusively for beryllium treatment. So again, these blue dots in your sapphire, not an indication, not conclusive proof of beryllium treatment, only proof of very intense treatment conditions. Then spectroscopy, I think, um, yeah, basically in 
maybe I'll just skip this one because this gets a little bit technical. But if you're into that, there's a lot of material available in literature uh, where people focus on FTIR spectroscopy specifically for um, detecting treatment in all different kinds of corundum. Now, of course, we focused on heat treatment here, and I've discussed three types mainly. Um, there are other treatments. I think dyeing is one that can go from introducing colored dyes into it to basically using a magic marker on it. Um, you've got filling of sapphires going on um, with oils and resin, very similar to amylar treatment. Um, so if you want to know more about that process, go look, um, go find some material in uh, that kind of literature. You can glass fill sapphires, and I think we see a great example here. Um, I've discussed the glass filling of rubies in depth in another lecture. Process is exactly the same, only the color of the glass is different. You can heat with added flux to um, try and heal some fractures. Again, this is the same process as in rubies. Not very common in sapphires, I might say. Um, but this entire process, I've discussed this in a ruby talk. Then we had a lot of um, talk about heating sapphires with added pressure in the last years. And in essence, this process is exactly the same as treating it at high temperature. There's just a little bit different variables. But what happens there is the same as heating at high pressure under, I think, reducing circumstances. It just goes faster. Um, and you contain the crystals so there's less fractures. And then, of course, we've got irradiation. Um, irradiation is probably is very difficult. It's very hard to detect. Um, and probably does not have a really big impact on blue color of sapphire. It has probably a much bigger impact on other color sapphires, but then we venture into the range of fancies. And I promise you guys that we'll keep fancy sapphire treatments for the next one. So my apologies for the technical uh, challenges that we had and for throwing so much technical content at you. I hope you guys all learned something from this. I see there's a bunch of questions, so I think we can take some time to go through that. Um, but I already want to say thank you so much for joining. I hope you enjoyed this. Make sure to check out the recording on YouTube later. And I think now we'll move into some Q&A. All right, Wim. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I'll, we've got time for just a few questions here. Um, uh, one question here. Have you encountered natural beryllium in blue sapphires? Yes, natural beryllium is something that we've seen. However, that natural beryllium is usually associated with other types of trace elements that are very uncommon, like tin, tungsten, uh, hafnium. Um, so that leads us to believe that that beryllium is not actually present in the corundum, but in microparticles. So it's not playing a role in the color of the corundum, but it is present in some natural sap. Great, thanks. Um, another question is, how do you evaluate the impurities in sapphire to get the desired color upon heating? Ah, well, I think that's a lot of experience that um, you need to judge. People that work a lot with it, um, they're able to estimate the density of that milky clouds, because that is what's going to determine the resulting blue color. Um, so this basically all comes down to experience. You could theoretically approach this stone by stone and evaluate every stone um, by analyzing how much silk there is, analyzing the chemistry and predicting what the color is going to be after heat treatment by also carefully controlling the heat treatment conditions. But that is, from a practical viewpoint, impossible. That can be done in a lab setting for some controlled experiments. Um, but from a practical view, that is uh, not really done. Great, thanks. Um, another question for you, is heat treatment always done on stones or are cut stones heated as well? Yeah, I think I've covered this a little bit. Um, a lot of rough is heated, um, especially when we're talking about processes that are not diffused. So that low temperature, high temperature treatment, usually done on the rough. Um, most diffusion processes are done, uh, especially the titanium diffusion is done on Cut stones. That's why they need a little bit of repolishing. Okay, great. Uh, can you can you just um, clarify what is meant by uh, the term Gouda for sapphires for people who aren't familiar with that term? 
Yeah, so Gouda sapphire is a Sri Lankan term for a certain variety of sapphire found in Sri Lanka that is typical whitish, yellowish, brownish, translucent because of that very high content of silk that scatters the light. So this is not really attractive material, um, but it does make an incredible change. So you've got that um, it is very cloudy, so it's not transparent. Uh, because of those big dense clouds of rutile particles and those scatter the light and those give you those milky white brownish yellowish colors. Um, yeah, it comes from the Sri Lankan terminology and there's like 24 varieties that they describe in Sri Lankan literature. So Geruda Sapphire is a field on its own and really interesting to study and study deeper. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, can you just touch on um, how does heat treatment work with Australian party color sapphire? So that's going to be your blue and yellow combination color stones. Um, which color stays dominant after heating? That all depends on the type of heat treatment that you do. Um, you could probably heat treat those to reduce the blue and intensify the yellow, but you could probably also um, reduce that yellow uh, color in those stones as well. Um, so that all depends on your exact treatment process. Um, I think that would be right. something, that would be a question for the guys who have actually treated a lot of Australian party yeah. material. Yeah, because that's very that complex material. Complicated for sure. Um, uh, I've got time for just one or two more and I'm going to throw this one at you because I'm a little bit biased towards photomicrography. Uh, what power of microscope was used for the photomicrographs? Um, so we've used a couple of uh, photomicrographs. Um, this one is at fairly high magnification. Those blue spots, um, they can be very small, but they, sometimes they're eye visible. Um, I think most of these images are taken with a standard gemological microscope. Right. This one might be the exception. Um, this is also cropped, so this is... Uh, very high magnification, but this one standard uh, gemological microscope, so somewhere in the range of 60x, um, sure. between between 15 and 60x. Right, um, so basically it's all, all stuff that you would see in your gemological microscope really. Most of this you could actually just see with a 10x loop, like for example right. here, these patterns you could probably make this out with a, um, with a 10x loop. Uh, those blue spots Usually they stand out very strongly against the background. So 10x loop is usually sufficient, although they are pretty small. Right. Okay, great. Um, I think last quick question here. Um, is the cobalt coated, coated sapphire, is that durable? To my knowledge, it is. I don't have a lot of experience with it. Um, of course, if you start recutting it, that's when it's gonna be an issue. But I think under normal conditions, it should be relatively stable. Right. Um, okay. I think I, got, I see one other very interesting question, uh, sure. more from a trade perspective. Uh, when a dealer says heat only, um, I think that's when people mean, uh, most people mean uh, low temperature treatment, high temperature treatment could both be heat only. It means that there's no chemicals added. Right. So there's no yeah, diffusion of beryllium and titanium. But again, there's a lot of confusing terminology out there in different trades, different trading cultures. Always ask more questions about heat treatment because some people call, um, call some of these untreated, some of them call them low, low treated. So always ask more questions to, your, uh, to the person that you're working with if you are unclear about it. If you're unclear, if you're still confusing, consult with a lab on this, especially when we're working with more challenging stones. For example, beryllium diffusion of blue sapphires. The only way to conclusively detect that would actually be by using, by analyzing the trace element chemistry because the resulting color will just be a lighter blue that looks exactly like a normal blue. Exactly, I think that's good advice. All right, well, thanks very much, Wim. Um, for anyone else, the, for the questions that we weren't able to get to, if you have other questions, please find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. 
Um, thanks all everyone for coming. And next time we'll be joined by Dr. Aaron Palke and Nick's son who will be discussing unusual phenomenal colored gemstones. Really looking forward to that one. That's going to be great. Right. Of course. All right. Thanks very much, everyone.